I was thinking about uh, doing this talk, I, I thought of several ways to start it. And uh, the way I chose is this one. Uh, I was sitting in my living room one day, and I got a call from the uh, director of a nuclear power plant. And he said to me, how do I know that I'm getting the faint signals? Okay. In the nuclear power business, faint signals are the precursors of potentially serious events. So the thing is, as a consultant, you never want to be in a situation where you have to say, I don't know. <laughs> right? So, so I, that's what I said, though. I, it's, it was true. I didn't know. I have, yes, sir, I don't have any idea. Okay. That was not the right answer. He was not impressed. And I felt terrible. So I worked on it for a year later and eventually came up with a valuable result. Um, so this is a theme I'm going to come back to. How do we know we're getting the faint signals? Okay. How do we know we're getting the faint signals? So my talk is on portal areas. And I got involved with the Yakima Indian Reservation portal area many years back. And this was actually, I think, 1981. And there were a series of articles in the MUFON UFO Journal describing very interesting events going on in this big Indian reservation which is out in Washington State. And I was young, or at least I was sure younger than I am now, and I was single, and I thought, why don't I just go out and take a look? So I wrote the Center for UFO Studies. It turned out that they had actually had somebody out there looking at things, and they had a loose leaf notebook that was that thick, full of incidents, which of course I read completely before I went out there, and then got in a car uh, along with a Native American who I hoped would actually be a kind of emissary because obviously it's a different culture, and I hoped that this would help in terms of talking to the people that I, that I talked to. So I literally went out there and, and lived in a tent for, it was a regular camping tent, for two weeks and went around and interviewed people. And I found some very interesting phenomena. Yeah, this is a picture of the reservation. Um, it's got the Gifford Penchant National Forest here on the west. It's very near to Mount Adams and a variety of other mountain ranges. Um, this is very near where the first UFO was sighted in 1947 by Kenneth Arnold. But this is the variety of phenomena that, that I found, OK? And all these things came up in the interviews that I did. Now, what do you do with something like this? Okay, We've got UFOs. All right, we know about that. We've got Bigfoot. We have psychic events. We have Big Bird. We have balls of light. Balls of light that often would be monitored by the people who sat up on the mountaintops watching for fires in the valley. In fact, some of the best witnesses were people who were these women who would literally sit up on a mountaintop and watch for fires in the valley. And they would see these balls of light moving in and out of the valley. What were they? Well, I, I didn't figure that one out. I was surprised to come across a couple UFO abductions. And you, you come across these events in, a, in, in the, the way that somebody says, well, you ought to talk to, to Bill about this particular thing. And so you go and talk to Bill, and you discover Bill is in the center of this very impressive abduction. There were, there were a couple of abductions, actually. <coughs> so um, the nice thing about the Yakim Reservation is that according to some of the locals, James Gilliland is one of them, there's a lot of ability to observe <coughs> UFOs, OK? People literally sit in. Jamie Gilliland's backyard and watched the UFOs. All right, well, so I'm sure, how many of you have ever heard of this before? Okay, so, um, but it's not just UFOs, it's all the other stuff too. So, I specialize in looking at hidden events. Hidden events are things that shouldn't happen but do, that many people experience but very few people want to talk about. And here are some examples. Uh, I've done about maybe 10 different studies on this. 
on things ranging from spontaneous human combustion to child abuse and black-footed ferrets and so on and so forth. I'm particularly interested in the flow of information about these hidden events. So the usual thing about hidden events is that they're dispersed widely in the population. So what you've got is a situation that sociologists call pluralistic ignorance, where lots of people experience something, but since nobody talks about it, you don't know if the other people have the experience, so you don't tell them about your experience, and so on and so forth. But what happens if you've got a concentration of anomalous events of different kinds, okay? That's clearly what we had on the Yakima Indian Reservation, a concentration of events of different kinds in one area. Okay, so it's a conglomerate. It's a portal area, and I'll, we'll talk about portals shortly here. Okay, so a portal area is a large area, hundreds or even thousands of square kilometers. There's diverse analysis events, and there's no obvious intuitive relationship between the events. In fact, you could almost say, well, they shouldn't be happening together, but they do. Okay, so it turns out that there are a couple other areas like this, and it took me a while to realize that I was familiar with the the other two areas, but I had never thought of them as another portal area. And I thought, well, hey, there's two more. One of them is San Luis Valley in Colorado, New Mexico. How many of you are familiar with San Luis? Okay. And the other was Southwest Pennsylvania in Westmoreland County. This doesn't sound like weird territory, but it is. Okay. We'll see how weird. Okay, so here's the San Luis Valley. Not a very good photo, I'm afraid. And Here's what we've got in the San Luis Valley. Enough stuff, basically, UFOs, Bigfoot, mutilated cattle, underground noises, psychic phenomena, black helicopters, and so forth, to have actually a really substantial business. And in Westmoreland County, we have the same kind of stuff. Now, what do these areas have in common? If I was really smart, I could probably tell you what they all have in common. But I, I don't know, actually. People write books about portal areas. Here are three of them. OK, so here's, here's the one about Yakima. Here's the one about the uh, San Luis Valley. And here's the one about southwest Pennsylvania. Who writes about portal areas? Now, this is where it gets interesting. How do we develop information about places like this? And the answer is people who live there. All three of the authors of these books are locals. And they typically lived in the area for a long time. And this is certainly true of Stan Gordon, who's been in southwest Pennsylvania for at least uh, 30, and it seems like 40 years. Uh, it's certainly true of Chris O'Brien, who's written three books, actually, on the San Luis Valley. And Greg Long, who wrote a book on the Yakima light phenomenon, and it's now published a book on Bigfoot. And so why is it that the locals write about the stuff? The reason is because there's lots of events, but they take place over long periods of time, okay? So the only way you're gonna find out about all this stuff is to be there, to live there. Um, so what goes on in the portal area? Why do we think of it as a portal area? Well, Seems like stuff comes in. Well, obviously, the question is, from where? And maybe it goes out, because it's not there all the time, right? Um, the nature of reality sometimes momentarily changes. We get an Oz effect. Or maybe there's just more stuff there, OK? I don't know, OK? Really, I, this is I, partly a brainstorming session to help me figure out what we really got here. Okay, so th furthermore, there's not a steady state. And so when I went out in 82, I had missed by about four years the big period of, of balls of light out at Yakima that had generated my original attention and so forth and got me to go out there and take a look. Um, so UFO sightings go up and down, balls of light go up and down, mutilated cows flourish or don't. Um, and in southwest Pennsylvania, they have Bigfoot sightings. Some a lot more in one year than another. Now you think about Pennsylvania. 
Bigfoot. That doesn't really make sense, does it? You know, isn't Pennsylvania settled? You know, where do they find the room for Bigfoot with all those people? Okay. Well, the interesting thing about this, I called Stan Gordon. I said, do you have a map of the, these events? And he said, no, we don't have any maps. But it turns out that the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society did have a map, actually. And they had a breakdown by county of how many Bigfoot sightings they had. Okay. So where was the biggest concentration where they had 117 Bigfoot sightings? It was in Westmoreland County. Where is Stan Gordon's UFO reporting center? It's in Westmoreland County. Okay. Now, was it providentially the case that basically the, when Stan Gordon started looking at this stuff, all of a sudden that was where all the events began to happen? No. We're looking at a reporting effect here, okay? So the interesting possibility is there's probably lots and lots of other reports in the other counties. Average number per, per county is about six, okay? You probably didn't think there were any Bigfoot in Pennsylvania, right? Wrong. Okay, so. What causes anomalies in these areas? Okay. Are we dealing with some sort of uh, geological effect? Uh, the Earth-light theory says basically balls of light are the result of some sort of geological problems and so forth. Is that right? Well, Greg Long actually tried to test that and was unconvinced at the end that basically it was geological. Is it a UFO portal? Do we have areas in the sky that open up and the UFOs come through? ostensibly probably go back. In the San Luis Valley, people have actually seen things vanish in the air by stages, okay? What is that? Is that stealth technology? I don't know. Peter Sturrock has the idea of a trans-dimensional duct between parallel universes. Sounds convincing to me. Could that explain it? Is that what a portal is? It's a duct. All right. So we have small scale examples of this sort of thing. John Alexander presented material on the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. How big is the area? Do you have any idea how big? About a mile square. Right. But other things happen in the vicinity and have for centuries. Right. So how big a vicinity? How big a vicinity? Yeah, well, the Yakima Reservation is huge. It's like 3,500 square miles, okay? So, but the, but the, the principle may be the same. I don't know. Um, now, here's a book about zone, called Zones of Strangeness. How many of you have heard of this book ever? Okay. Not very good, actually. Now, here's another interesting fact if it is a fact. And that is, if we look at the distribution of information, there's a temptation to see it having a nice bell curve shape, okay? And so the information in principle should be widely spread. But actually, I think it's probably more like this. In other words, if you're living there, then all this stuff is sort of second nature to you. You don't really pay much attention to it until, of course, something happens to you. Like Amy's story about the the globes, okay? So why should we study portal areas? Well, maybe portal areas offer clues to the nature of things like Bigfoot and UFOs. Maybe diverse events actually are related in some way. But what is the way? How could UFOs be related to Bigfoot? Okay? I honestly haven't a clue. But in Pennsylvania, there has been this long-term relationship that Stan Gordon has been talking about literally for decades. Okay, there are problems in studying portal areas. The first problem is data capture. I mentioned that Stan, in spite of the fact that he's lived there for, that, that's all right, for 30 years, there's no maps. He hasn't made a map of where things happen, okay? Um, so who investigates? Do you have a database? 
Is the data compared internally? Is it compared externally? How are the data displayed? Timelines, maps, multi-dimensional uh, databases. Can data be transferred to another researcher? Uh, second problem is theory. Okay. So the, the average investigator is typically not a theorist. And in fact, a lot of investigators are scientifically challenged. We're not going to make any assertions here about people in specific. Theorists seldom approach ill-defined problems like this. And this is an ill-defined problem, I, I admit. And then you've got a scientific team. Okay. Now, the ideal, of course, would be to have something like the Skinwalker Ranch, where you've got how many millions of dollars of investment, a lot of highly qualified scientific people. But the problem is, at the end, what do you got? I'd say modest results would be my assessment. John, do you want to take, take me out on the modest results uh, comment? OK. So wider implications. If there's a portal, if there's a portal, who built it? What's it for? If the portal communicates someplace else, what's come through it? What's going to come through it next? Are we missing some key pieces of evidence? The SETI program, the whole basis of SETI, is basically researching for electromagnetic signals from elsewhere. What if, instead of that, we've got another way of getting from one solar system to another, and we're not even paying attention to it? So are we missing the faint signals? So we've got this problem. It's very ill-defined. It didn't strike me, I, I admit this, <laughs> until six months ago, and I thought I'm going to give a talk at SSC. What's it going to be about? And I thought this would be a fascinating thing to look at. And I thought, well, I know of these other two portal areas. Why don't I talk about this as a concept, a class of events, OK? Especially because you have the Skinwalker Ranch, which is a, certainly a very small scale thing. But poses many of the same problems, all right? So I don't know where to begin on this. I mean, I sat on this data for a long time, and uh, I don't know, you know where to go next with this. Uh, I'm looking for ideas. And uh, obviously, I'm looking for people who might be interested in investigating these problems, but it's not easy, OK? These are big areas. This stuff's been going on for a long time. And even though there are people who are local experts in this, it's not going to be a simple matter. Thank you. Uh, just very briefly, have you considered the possibility that you uh, might, might have the causal relationship inverted? Because weird things happen a lot everywhere. Uh, and you, you said that you, you only find out about these portal areas when there's been somebody who's been living there a long time, who is also observant and articulate enough to write a book. And what if it's simply that those areas appear to be portal areas because there's somebody been living there a long time who's articulate and observant? That's a very good question. So the immediate answer is if you look on a site called Alien Vacation. You will f <laughs> I'm not making this up, OK. <laughs> two, of, two of the areas identified are Yakima and uh, a city in the uh, San uh, uh, Miguel Valley. So um, I'm, not, I'm not making it up. And also, the, Yakima is a city that has, according to the internet, the most UFO sightings in any American city. <laughs> John. Uh, um, regarding Skinwalker, there's a term that I created for working there called the precognitive sentient phenomena, meaning that it knew and it was very resistant to, so when you want to go study it, it was very resistant. We had the ranch instrumented. And I think what would happen is just off camera, or things would happen that should have been on camera that won't. 
And last year we had a whole panel on the, the trickster uh, phenomena. And I think that that's greatly you know, what's involved. It is not easy. So using your traditional methods of I'll go watch, I'll do, you know, everything we tried, it was one step ahead, whatever it is, and it was in control. Well, the Indians told me when I got to Yakima about the previous effort on the part of the Center for UFO Studies who had sent an engineer uh, along with lots of apparatus, okay? So the engineer is sitting on this hillside. He's got his recording magnetometer. He's got, you know, radiation meters, everything ready to go and so forth. So here comes a greasy light bulb over the top of the hill. So what the, what, what's his scientific response? Oh, my God, what is it? Tell me what it is. And the Indians thought that was really funny, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> none of the equipment worked. <laughs> That's typical. Um, I take a different approach. Um, I've been all over the world tracking Earth lights, and there are about 100 places on Earth where Earth lights normally occur. And if you uh, count those as portals, uh, I can tell you uh, some information that they're all above back background radiation. Uh, there are magnetic anomalies uh, and magnetic variability uh, anomalies that come and go. They're not there, they're not there constantly. And um, I, I think that's all I have to say. Well, along those lines, I'm interested in your thoughts about crop circles. They seem to occur in certain regions, especially southern England, where there are known sacred sites, ley lines, what have you, and maybe some of the magnetic anomalies that she's referring about. Any thoughts about those in portal areas? Crop circles are also related to individuals. I mean, there, there are certain individuals who literally can say, well, hey, there's going to be a crop circle here, and the next thing you know, there's a crop circle, okay? And it's not hoaxers, it's something else, okay? Um, I'm not, I don't know, but crop circles didn't seem to be part of the, this particular phenomenon it, in this case. Here's your exit. No crops. No crops, sir. Um, many years ago, uh, a, a high voltage DC power line was built from the middle of North Dakota to Minneapolis. Right. Hundreds of miles. Maybe you were involved because. No. And and there was a one county, which maybe is 20 miles along this power line where people were sick, the animals were sick, to the point that they started cutting down these big towers. And so the sheriffs were up there. And actually, I was talking, this is one of the, my early SSE meetings, the physicist at the meeting actually was involved in a panel. And the, the conclusion was there is nothing really different in the fields or anything else except this one section. Everybody seemed to have sickness, and the animals were sick and everything. But it sort of follows up what York said. I mean, uh, all the hundreds of miles uh, in either direction, there was no problem. Yeah, usually it's ozone um, from the wires. But I, 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 I don't, I've never heard about that before. I know that there was a lot of uh, what you might call citizen resistance to the uh, power lines. And that a lot of them got shot out with high-powered rifles. And, yes, and they had a barbecue, and then they would topple the tower, you know. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. My pleasure.